Okay, so what I wanted to do was uh, sort of get ready to launch on actually doing some searches and things, and I want to inventory what Max has and Jonathan and so on, and continue working on this guide page of functions. Um, meanwhile, I was thinking a little bit about um, dimension versus curvature in networks. And I was sort of thinking about some scattering experiments that one could do, well, kind of geodesic experiments. So imagine you take a, um, you know, like a hexagonal, essentially two-dimensional graph, and you start adding extra connections to it. Though, so those extra connections, in some sense, I mean, if you add enough extra connections, you can, uh, in a certain pattern, you will get a uh, higher dimension. The question is what, you know, as you add those extra connections, um, you know, what's the trade-off between getting curvature and dimension of the limiting manifold? Does that make any sense? Right. And there's a certain pattern of connections that will lead one to kind of validly have kind of higher dimension, but those connections are, I think, necessarily non-local. In other words, as you imagine going from the two-dimensional, uh, uh, you know, structure, well, let's, let's imagine you were in a one-dimensional structure and you wanted to go to two dimensions. You could imagine, you know, that you were kind of curling it up in a space filling curve and adding edges between the, the pieces of the space filling curve, if that makes sense. Right. Um, but the question is really how, um, gosh, how does, uh, how does one think about that? Because I mean, making it, curling it up into a space filling curve is a very global thing to do. Um, and, uh, but if one just starts adding, I mean, again, I don't think we're going to know how these um, limiting, these networks limiting to manifolds work until we're actually generating them. But it's still kind of interesting to kind of start imagining this limiting process. Uh, well, you get the point. The question is, what's the trade-off? As you limit to a manifold, what's the trade-off between dimension and curvature? In a sense, the dimension is the leading term, the curvature is the subleading term. Um, and the question is, is there some, uh, you know, imagine that you have, imagine the following thing. So in these derivation of the Einstein equations, the question is, could there be a trace of varying dimension left over? That is, if the thing is at a, uh, if the dimension, if the limiting dimension is somehow limits to some kind of constant, I don't know, the, the, you know, just like you might imagine things to be asymptotically flat with respect to curvature, is there an analog of that with respect to dimension? In the sense that things are asymptotically, let's say three dimensional, three plus one dimensional, whatever, but have some, um, uh, you know, and, and could there be some way that there are leftover terms that come from, um, let's say, you know, let's say you're at some maximum or stationary point with respect to dimension. One could imagine second order terms that represent, you know, the, uh, um, you know, the next corrections after extremization. Did that make any sense? Yeah, but I, um, is that, I mean, is any of this really any different for say, from saying that if you take the discrete Ricci scalar and you allow it to have a non-trivial dependence on the radius, then any distinction between dimension and curvature goes away? No, I, I think it's different. I think it's different because, I mean, I think it's related but I think one of them is an asymptotic dependence of the form R to the D, and one of them is an asymptotic dependence of the form R to the D minus two. 
Right, but the but the, that's that's the point that in effect the, the curvature is the correction factor for the r to the d plus two. And so, so if you, if you allow there to be dependence between big R and little R, then there's no. Wait a minute. How we got way too many R's involved here, including <laughs> right, the curvature tensor itself. Yes, yeah, so I would say okay. Big, big R is the scalar. Little R is the is the distance. Okay. As soon as those become coupled, you can accommodate the correction factors for both terms with one quantity, which I think is the, the formal way of saying that we can treat curvature as a local change in dimensionality. Skeptical I am. Well, let's see. Can you... Um, uh, okay. Uh, maybe. I mean, I, I think it'll have a different dependence, won't it? I mean, in other words, one thing has dependence has uh, power law dependence on little r. Well, you say both of them have power law dependence, but they're different powers. Right, right. Which is, uh, I think this is what the, the whole, the scale relativity people are trying to get at, is that essentially you have, you can have, I guess what are almost like kind of phase transitions where, you know, the scaling relation changes as you move from different distance scales, or move between different distance scales. Okay. And, and that's, uh, you know, th th there's a whole kind of like scale dependence of Hausdorff dimensionality sort of idea that connects with fractals and things. But I think that's, that's probably the right way of thinking about it is that there's so suddenly you have a scale dependence of not, not of the scalar curvature, but actually of the scaling relations of the scalar curvature. What do you mean the scaling relations of the scalar curvature? So that at, at, for some length scales, it will scale like R to the D for some, it will scale like R to the D minus two. Some well, why is it scaling like anything? Be, because we, we want to be able to say, so, you know, if you have fixed dimensionality, then you have, you know, the, then, then, the, then the, um, the volume metric is given by, you know, the, uh, the distance times one minus uh, distance squared over two N plus two uh, times the scalar curvature plus subleading terms. Yeah. But, if you don't, but if you relax the requirement of having fixed dimensionality, that's equivalent to saying that, well, the, the, the second order term can, can depend, can scale with the distance. Yes. But in order to make that a kind of uh, a theory that's consistent with the different scaling relations, I, th I think that the argument in scale relativity, at least, and I think it's probably true in this discrete case as well, is that, there that you have to have different scaling, so that on, on micro scales, the scaling relation for the Ricci scalar is different to the scaling relation on macro scales. Um, I, I'm going to put, I'm going to try and make this as formal as I can. I'm going to put it in the um, relativity and gravitation write up, and you can good. know what you think. But. Good, good, good. Uh, okay. Um. Incidentally, while we're on the topic, uh, so I did discuss the relativity and gravitation derivation with Jose for quite some time. And. Uh -huh. The one point of contention that came up, and actually also came up during our um, during our talk, was about time symmetry, and and you know whether one has uh, sufficient macroscopic reversibility in these theories to be consistent with GR. Okay, explain why there's any issue with reversibility at all. Uh, well, so. I had been operating under the slightly hand wavy assumption that if one had causal invariance and one had asymptotic dimensionality preservation, that one couldn't have uh, sort of rules that lost information, so to speak. Um, you know, M Max brought up the, the counter example of, well, if you just have a rule that says, you know, AB goes to empty set or something, that's something that obviously isn't reversible. But, I, but my claim was, well, that's something where I, I think any rule of that form where you lose reversibility due to loss of information won't will either violate causal invariance or will violate. Uh, I think I think the point is that once look you in most of these systems you quickly evolve to an attractor which is effectively reversible, even if you weren't at the beginning, so to speak. If the thing's going to survive, it's probably got to have some uh, you know measure that isn't decreasing, otherwise it's not going to survive. I agree, but I I want. I want something like a formal proof of that. Um, well, I think the I formal have... proof is, is, I mean, it's basically an approach to equilibrium proof. Right? So, I mean, in other words, you start off with any, um, I mean, like in cellular automata, that's a, uh, if you look at the entropy, 
um, something like the spatial entropy, as I called it, for cellular automata, okay, which is the number of, um, uh, on every time step, the, um, uh, let's say, the P log P entropy associated with the possible blocks of length N for increasing N, okay? The, so if you look at that and you ask the question, how does it vary with time, right? At the beginning, for an irreversible rule, it can decrease. But after a while, but it can't go on decreasing forever because if it did, there'd be nothing left, so to speak. So what happens is that it winds up going to a constant value. And I think that's, um, uh, I mean, you know, it's worth remembering that the microscopic, uh, you know, that in fact we know that there is some violation of, of time reversal invariance in, you know, quantum field theory in particle physics. Um, so having a theory in which everything is perfectly reversible, um, well, it, it's not. No, but we, but we need an effective theory that is. And, and in, in your claim about, okay, if it does, if you have some measure and it's, you know, if it's contracting, contracting it will limit to zero. Uh, that doesn't assuage my concerns about things where it sort of oscillates or something. Um, no, it could happen. But, but I mean, let's say it oscillates on sufficiently short timescales, who cares? We wouldn't know. I mean, in other words, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable point. But I think of all the various things that I'm worried about, that's one of the less worrying to me. I mean, I think it is a little bit odd in a multi-way setting, if there's continued branching, that is pretty weird in terms of information content. Um, and that is probably something to understand that the effective, you know, if the effective causal network after you do the modding out by, you know, your scheme of adding critical pairs. The question is, well, so, so what property would the causal network have to have so that you have effective reversibility? Well, it would, it would have to be the case that for any, for any foliation, it's possible to reconstruct its neighbors, its neighboring foliations, I guess would be the... Why is that relevant to this? I mean, once you have a causal network, you, you know, foliations are kind of gone. Uh, is that true? I mean, so, so time evolution is the, is the evolution between neighboring hypersurfaces, between neighboring uh, hypersurfaces and the yeah, foliation. Yeah, I understand. But, but the question is, what's the signature of information preservation in the causal network? Because the issue is not so much, I mean, given a particular, uh, I mean, uh, okay, so, uh, you know, this question of contraction in phase space, basically, which is what you're talking about, is not, I think, an issue. I mean, the, the sort of relativistic transformations on that contraction in phase space are really not the point. The point is, is there ultimately, you know, is it ultimately a dissipative system that is contracting its volume in phase space? And my guess is that that so let's think about that for a second. I mean, in, in um, uh, look, in the causal network, there's the question of whether, um, uh, let's think, let's think. Give I think the there are features of the causal network that could make it be considered irreversible, but I'm trying to think how, you know, how you'd measure, go ahead, what were you gonna say? I, I don't know. I'm just. Gen I'm skeptical about. Given that this is a a bulk property of an effective theory, um, I'm I'm skeptical about being able to deduce any to deduce anything about that from the sort of combinatorial structure of the causal network, which is about the micro theory. Maybe there is a way, but I. Um, well, wait a minute. Why are we saying? I mean, there's a there's a macroscopic version of the causal network too. But that's just a space time manifold, isn't it? We hope. Okay, what's the relationship between? What, I mean, no, I mean, it gives you the, it, look, it gives you causal relations, which are not the manifold. They're something that exists on the manifold. That the thing effectively behaves as if it lives in a manifold, 
but nevertheless, the actual network of relations is, you know, is the network of relations, not the manifold itself. No, but that, so that's a set of things that are preserved under conformal rescalings of the manifold, I believe. Why are we talking about conformal rescalings? Because in, in relativity, uh, causal relations are preserved under conformal rescalings. That's Fair why enough, we talk, one talks about conformal structure of space-time when one talks about causal relations. Unfortunately, though, since we have an ultimately discrete system, we don't get to have scale invariance in that sense. We can only have that in some limiting sense. Right, right. Whereas in the traditional theory, it's you know conformal invariance all the way down, so to speak. Right. Well, interesting. Okay, I mean, I there are. Um, let me think about this for a second. You know, in almost any of these theories, yeah, I'm still trying to understand what is the analog of. You know, how do we measure the entropy of the system? Well, we have to coarse grain in some way, and then we ask the question of the possible states, you know, how many occur, and then how many occur as you uh, evolve forwards in the causal network. Does that make sense? Right. And, um, you know, that's the thing we have to measure. And if that doesn't decrease, we're in good shape. If it does decrease, it's bad. And I think that the, I mean, I kind of think, I mean, like visually in a cellular automaton, you can kind of see if the thing is decaying to lower entropy by basically seeing if the patterns you get no longer look random, but have, you know, but kind of uh, um, sort of uh, decay out to something much simpler. So the question is for the causal network, is there something similar that one will see? Namely, that as you move forward in the causal network, that uh, what was something that seemed to be kind of random and had lots of microstates evolves to something that has effectively fewer microstates. Right. My guess is that it's fairly... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay, I'm... Uh, again, there's a there's an issue because there's dynamics going on at a micro scale, and uh, well, yeah, exactly what the reversibility of the dynamics at the macro scale is is not so clear. But I think at the micro scale, I would suspect it's going to be fairly obvious whether the thing is effectively contracting or not. Yeah, and I mean, we should. Yeah. Right. I was going to say that that's fine, and, and that will presumably be very useful for proving kind of that we get some approximation to unitary evolution. But yes. for relativity, we need a dip, as you say, there's a, there's the macro scale reversibility, and that I think is much more connected to the foliation of the causal network and, and things to do with strong hyperbolicity and non intersecting of non intersection of hypersurfaces and things. And that's something I haven't possibly. Yet figured yeah, that's out. possible. I mean, but uh, look, in that world, um, I don't even know in the case where the space-time gets wild and starts having singularities and event horizons and so on, um, do you understand how that works? Because that's not so obvious right. how that, I mean, you know, the, the forward evolution, I mean, you know, welcome to the world of black holes where the forward evolution of something, you know, gets, is not, is not nominally reversible in many cases. Well, I mean, th this is the thing. It, it's um, the degree to which one has reversibility depends on the answers to, questions about strong cosmic censorship and about information paradoxes and things, which we don't know the answer yeah, right. to. Well, that's the quantum answer. case, but even in the classical case, right? In the classical case, just random waves propagating towards a black hole just get lost. Right, I mean, well, strong cosmic, strong cosmic censorship is a, is a classical posture, uh, is a uh, conjecture. I understand, but, but that, that, well, but what does that have? I mean, that, that's just talking about the lack of naked singularities, which is not telling you about no, things no, that, going... No, that's, no, that's weak cosmic censorship. Strong cosmic censorship is about the degree to which relativity is deterministic. Oh, yeah? Okay. What, are... does it, what does it say? The, so what does it say happens when, when a random photon propagates towards a random, uh, you know, electromagnetic wave propagates towards an event horizon? Uh... If the strong cosmic censorship hypothesis is violated, 
it says that that is a non-deterministic, that the outcome of that interaction is non-deterministic. And um, what's the, what does it say? So, I mean, but the thing goes <laughs> and, you know, one would assume it just goes over the event horizon and one doesn't, you know, it's not part of that, uh, I don't know, that chart or something. Anyway. Right, right. So the, the conjecture formally will state that, so we, we're assuming that, the, that, the, that there's a maximal Cauchy development that's not extendable beyond that point. Okay. Right. And the strong cosmic censorship hypothesis says, if it's violated, says that it actually is, and it can be extended as a regular Lorentzian manifold beyond the point where general relativity is deterministic. Okay, all right, so, fine. But, but so um, what are you saying? That you're just saying that it's a manifold with boundary, and so don't ask what happens if you go over the boundary. Right, exactly. It's saying that there should be some reason why we can't extend the, uh, you know, the data beyond right. that point. Yeah, but fair we, don't, we don't know mathematically that that's true. And until we do, it's not, it, I don't think it will be clear. I mean, well, it's possible that our model will end up resolving the strong cosmic censorship hypothesis. But um, yeah, right. Well, I mean, the question of what, what it looks like in, um, uh, you know, what event horizons look like in a world of, of um, I mean, I don't even know what, what does an event horizon look like in a causal network? I would think that it has, that's a, an adventure of Cauchy surfaces, so to speak. And I would suspect that what it does is, um, uh, you know, if you, if you see, it's gonna end up that the causal network just doesn't give you causation across the event horizon somehow. Well, isn't it just a reachability problem? It's saying that w w yeah. the presence of an event horizon is, is saying that once you get to this point in the causal network, you can't reach future yep. null infinity, which is the other point. Yep, 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 yep. Yep, but I mean, that means in terms of a graph, that means, I think, there simply aren't edges there. No, that, that, uh, is that true? No, it, so. it, it, because it can, it, you could have a thing where... Oh, you can you go have, into that, you but edges. you can't get out. Yeah, right. you can go in, but you can't get out. Which, which would be Correct. like a cosmic yeah. event horizon. So I think what it really is saying is that if you call vertex components on you know, one part of the causal network, you can't, it's, it's like the other part of the causal network is not, part of that, is not a subset of that. What is vertex components? Is, is that the, I, I think that's the command. It, it, I mean, it basically tells you, yeah, ver, sorry, vertex component tells you all the vertices that can be reached from a single I vertex. See. And I think as, if, if, if there's another side of the causal network that can't be reached. Yeah, 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 be right. Vertex I agree. I agree. It sounds right. It doesn't seem to think vertex components exists. What is it called? Vertex component. Sorry. Why it doesn't... <laughs> You know, Sushma Wright report that as a yet another. Um, yeah. Okay. By the way, question about hypergraphs. To what extent can we support all of these things like vertex components and so on in our hypergraphs? I think we can. I, I mean, actually, that was something I wanted to ask is whether I should just be working, given that I have um, the isomorphism stuff working, should I just work on porting as much of the graph theory functionality to hypergraphs and putting it in the function repository as possible? I think that would be nice. I mean, what are we going to do? Are we going to call it hypergraph vertex component and things? That's or been we, my approach so far, yeah. Or are we going to have an up value on hypergraph for vertex component, et cetera, which I think would be even cleaner. And which is supportable in the function repository, right? Sushma, that's right, isn't it? You can, you can have up values. Given that you have a thing in the function repository, like the hypergraph wrapper, mm -hmm. you can have up values on that for arbitrary functions. Yeah, I, I, I recall that is possible, yes. I think that's how we did the quaternions thing, for yeah. instance. So I think that would be more elegant. I mean, unless the hypergraph case is different somehow. I, I mean, that okay, we better inventory that question. To what extent are the graph theoretic functions, um, you know, do they have the same argument structure and so on for... Uh, it was more complicated. What's that? It's a bit more complicated. Max, you're going in and out of audio. Um, you're saying someone more complicated. Well, give an example. Yeah, I mean, things like this are probably more complicated. Maybe not. Can you give an example of something which is definitively more complicated in the hypergraph case? I mean, even things like Violex out component will be more complicated. 
Yeah, I don't know what vertex degree means, I agree. What does vertex degree mean? No, vertex degree is fine. It just means how many hyper edges this vertex exists in. Fair enough. Well, actually, uh, let's see. Well, actually, oh, that's uh, correct. I think that's correct. Well, yeah, that's correct. But then vertex out degree is not obvious at all. By the way, why on earth is that post is using? This is again shoddy documentation here. This should be vertex labels arrow automatic here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, sorry, what were you saying, Max? A vertex out degree and in degree would be not obvious at all. I'm not sure that's true. I mean, in the ordered case, I think it's perfectly well defined, isn't it? It's just, right, it's things where the hyper edge leads to how many vertices does the hyper edge lead to? Right. And as long as you have an adjacency structure that's like if you have a hyper edge ABC, A, you know, A leads to B and C. B leads to C, then wait, that's wait, a general, right? Okay, except we agree that vertex degree is number of hyper edges, not the number of vertices. Uh, but in the case, when you, when you have a multi-graph, vertex degree the number, is, the, is the number of vertices. Wait a minute. Vertex degree is the number of vertices or the number of edges? I thought it was the number of vertices. Let me, let me double check. Uh, is there a, is there an example? No, the vertex degree for a vertex is the number of edges incident to V. By the way, it should have in the details here. It should say something about multigraphs. But if you look at scope, that's not how it works. Well, then it's wrong. No, I'm not sure it is. I think that's the sensible way to do it for directed multi for oh sorry for multigraphs. You're saying how many? Okay, multigraphs three three two. No, it's three, three, two. Look, it's, it's, that's three edges, right, coming out of that. It's not the number of nodes you reach from a given vertex. It's the number of edges connected. Look, look at this thing. I mean, it's, it's right. the number of edges. So, what's... So, so it is. It's the number of hyper edges that for a given node, it's the number of hyper edges that contain that node. Right, so in this case, the number okay, of edges actually, that contain a given node. Uh, I think vertex out and in degrees should be generalized to have vertex degree where vertex is at particular place in the, you know, symmetry group, so to speak. Um, so if it's ordered, you have vertex degree where this vertex is first, second, and third instance or if it's yeah sorry Yeah, probably vertex degree should take a second argument or something that would specify position of the vertex in the hyper edge. Well, here what it's doing it would be a third argument because it's got the graph and the vertex specifying yeah. the vertex to be yeah, for a given vertex, so, which is otherwise known as a node label. So am I, am I correct in saying that vertex out degree would return the number of hyper edges that doesn't have that vertex as its last element? No, I don't think we should have vertex out degree with hypergraphs. But would that not be the it's obvious confusing. generalization? I'm str okay, listen, listen. The meta point here is, do we want to support hypergraph vertex degree, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or do we want to overload the existing vertex degree stuff? I think it's better to overload, except uh, it would have to have three arguments in. Eh? 
Right. Um, okay. Well, I mean, this is going to be, look, introducing hypergraphs as fundamental things in 12.2 will have to do all of that stuff. Maybe, okay, what worries me is that we're going to end up with functions which are mostly overloaded functions, but a few aren't going to fit, and we're going to need special hypergraph versions of them. Am I making sense? So I'm concerned about how to deal with that before we really, I mean, look, what we got to do is just go through and figure out how do we generalize all the existing graph theory functions to hypergraphs. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what has to happen. Um, but I think, like, find shortest path, that's readily generalizable to hypergraphs, correct? I think so. Well, except if we have directed graph, it becomes not obvious again. Why? I mean, you're saying find shortest path between Well, this nodes. ordered hypergraph is, is fine. For arbitrary symmetry groups, it's not obvious at all. Why? I mean, doesn't it say... Isn't it just, can you get, I see, arbitrary symmetry groups? Well, I, I don't understand. If the, what does the symmetry group say about whether you have effectively a connection between node, you know, I and node J? In the case of an unordered hypergraph. Well, no, suppose, suppose a symmetry group says for, uh, for a hyper edge. And the first and last vertices are equivalent, and the second and third vertices are equivalent. What, would what do you mean, mean by equivalent? I mean, so hold on. If if you have a cyclic thing, then it's pretty obvious that things can are reachable no. in that cyclic order. Oh, not not cyclic. Not cyclic. It, it means you can interchange the first and fourth vertex and second and third. Well, but doesn't interchange mean just mean if you come in on one, if you come into one of those vertices, it's free to go out one of the other, the other vertex that's equivalent to it. Yeah, but can you go from one to two or from two to one? Well, you said that those aren't equivalents in your model. One and three are equivalent and two and four are equivalent, right? So yes, we'll say one not of... equivalent, but in ordered case, you might, I mean, in the normal directed graph, the two vertices of an edge are also not equivalent, but you still can go from one to the other. In one direction. But you can't go in yes. the other direction. Right. <laughs> so if yeah. you have one and four and two and three equivalent, which direction should you be able to go? One to two or two to one? I'm conf I, I understand, I think, the issue. But um, it, why would that make any difference? Because if one and four are equivalent, shouldn't they have the same adjacencies? Okay, you can go between two and three as, as much as you want. You can go between one and four. But then the yes. question is, can you go between one and two? Or should you go the other? I mean, going from one to two is equivalent from going from four to three. I, I understand. But if, they, if, they're, if they're equivalent under, under, some, under the action of some symmetric group, is it not the case that one and four and two and three will have the same adjacency relations? I, I still don't understand why we, why we can't just generalize, you know, the notion of, a, of direction is now given by, we have, you know, the adjacency structure being given by the order relation on hyper edges. And I think that gives you all the generalization you need, unless, unless there's something I've yeah, missed. It's, only, it's a partially ordered set. Right, this exactly. So, which is what I was trying to say before. I, I, I still don't understand yeah, why that's not. But that has to spe separately specify because just a symmetry group doesn't give us enough information. Okay, I'm not sure. I don't understand why the symmetry group doesn't tell us which partially ordered set corresponds to the vertices. 
Okay, let's say we have symmetry group with two generators, one, four, and two, three. Right. What do you think is adjacency matrix for one is going to be? I think we need to, okay, let's figure this out separately, but let's decide, I mean, the, you're saying there might need to be some additional specification. We haven't yet even set up hypergraphs with, uh, you know, with symmetry groups at the, uh, associated with the hyper edges. And maybe when we do that, we yes, have we to can. find this. Right, maybe this thing is part of the definition of a hyper edge with symmetry group. Yes, I is. think it is, but it's not necessary for everything. Well, I understand that. So you're saying that certain functions will say, I can't work because I don't have the information. Just like I'm sure there are functions we have right now that don't yeah. work without, um, uh, uh, you know, directed edge information and things. I'm not sure. Well, I'm, you know, there are things which are going to have to default. So, for example, well, they assume max something. Flow. Yeah. Yeah, their max flow will assume that the weights are the same for every edge and things. Um, okay. So, what is our bottom line here? Are we going to try to overload hypergraph? I think we should try, and I think we should be looking down all these functions and seeing which ones, and in and, and some cases we might have to add arguments to these functions, which is not undoable given, um, uh, you get what I'm saying? The only downside is it's incompatible, well, sorry, not incompatible, it's inconsistent with the function repository entries I've been producing. What do you mean? That the function repository entries I've made that are now in the function repository for hypergraphs don't, aren't overloads of the existing graph functionality, they're new functions. Well, that's we can the nature of the that. function repository. I mean, right. things like that can happen. Uh, but I think, you know, having, I mean, how many is it going to be? It's going to be like 50 functions that are hypergraph, this, that, and the other for each of these. I mean, is your, is your hypergraph? In, in um, the case where you give it a graph, it's function, it should be functionally equivalent to the, uh, to the equivalent graph cases. Right. By the way, it is shockingly slow relative to, I mean, I tried running it on some medium sized hypergraphs. Your, okay. your function is definitely not the speediest. I mean, uh, for example, I, we need to understand how Edpeg's heuristic canonicalizer relates to what your function is doing. It's probably because it's not compiled. Okay. Well, we could compile it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if we can do, I don't know how complicated it is, but, but okay, look, but the, the question, okay, I'm sorry, just zooming out for a second. Do we understand how it corresponds to what Ed Pegg's function is operationally doing? Uh, words, no, I, I can look through, I can look through what Ed did though, but. I mean, um, what Ed did is fairly simple. The question is operationally, what, you know, we can do a test, which hypergraphs does Ed's stuff effectively assume are isomorphic? And does it, which, which isomorphisms does it fail to pick up that yours gets, right? right? So Ed has claimed that he hasn't, his thing hasn't missed any isomorphisms that he's aware of. Okay, so I think we need to ask Ed, we need to give Ed your function and say, go figure out, you know, where there's a deviation between what your function is saying and what his function is effectively saying. Missing, uh, yeah, but missing isomorphisms, I mean, the, the, the hard part is, is, the, is the other way around. The hard part is identifying isomorphisms where they don't exist. That's, that's the thing that's hard to iron out. Well, I understand. But if your function, assume your function is correct. Okay. Then I don't believe Ed's function is, I believe Ed's claim is, that his thing may not successfully canonicalize. That is, there may be a more minimal uh, instant instance of the hypergraph transformation rule than he can find. You see what I'm saying? So that means- so that's, Okay, that, that is interesting. That's a case of missing isomorphisms where they exist. That's usually not yeah. how these things go. 
usually it's that they, they claim we can spot an isomorphism where, wherever it exists, but we can't prove that it will successfully distinguish non-isomorphic graphs. So if, if he has it the other way around, that right. maybe makes it easier. Distinguish non yes, I mean, what he's doing is he's effectively constructing the isomorphism, right? And he may fail to construct an isomorphism when in fact an isomorphism can be constructed. Yes, yeah, and I, I'm saying that's that's interesting because it's the op, you know usually it's the you know it's false, uh, false negative rather than, oh no false positive rather than false negative, or maybe the other way around. Um. Okay. Okay. So I'm sorry. Let's let's go back to the original topic here, which was trying to fill in functions and the state of Max's uh, hypergraph visualization and so on. Please. Well, I'm still working on it. Okay. All right. Well, so, I mean, this is what I want to start using, preferably, you know, today, so to speak. So, um, what should we do? Should I use the existing well, version? I... Should I wait for till later today, or what's the story? Well, the plan is to finish it by the end of today. Okay, fine, fine, okay. If you're still on plan, then that's all good, I guess. I mean, I yeah, would have I liked to so. work on it today, but um, do you have a preliminary version? What, what, are you, what is it that you're doing exactly? You're, you're getting it so that it agrees with the documentation and the design that we had, is that correct? Well, it, it agrees for the most part. I mean, right now I'm implementing different embeddings. Different what? Embeddings. Okay. Okay. Now, what about the, I mean, is this, is part of this project doing the, I mean, okay. So we've, we've also got the corresponding embedding for the left and right hand sides of rules, correct? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I want to know whether I can start actually running searches and expect sort of uh, expect that we can do visualization with some version of this hypergraph plot. I mean, I can do it with the existing version and then wait and rerun it with the newer version. Is that the right thing to do? Well, I mean, if you, if you want to do it today, then I think you should just use existing one for now. Okay. All right. Fine. Fine. I will do that. And then we'll rerun it. Okay. Now, next question. The, um, that thing that you had, which I didn't pay enough attention to, where we had a rather exotic looking um, uh, final state, but when you reran it with different updating orders, it didn't look exotic anymore. What was the story behind that? Well, so there is a difference in updating order in that before it took the oldest vertex and then try to match that. Now it, it tries to match it so that the most recent vertex in the rule input is as old as possible. Okay. Don't we want options, though, to determine which of these it tries to do? Because we want to find out how robust the result is relative to different updating orders. Yes, we do want options, but options are not implemented yet. Okay. All right. But anyway, you've changed the default behavior of Wolfram model. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And is that in the version that I have right now? Yes. Okay. 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 Did you put something in that is a pure count of vertices in instead of states list, um, whatever we called it, state, what, I forget what we called it, but the thing that just counts the number of vertices and just returns that list. No, not yet. I mean, uh... I mean, that seems worth having because in some cases, those structures are going to be quite large and I don't see the reason to actually form them and transmit them. Does that make sense? Yes, I agree. I mean, uh, is it really that slow that it's useful right now? I'm sorry? 
I mean, is it really that slow? I don't have any idea. I don't know. All I know is that if we start scanning millions of rules, it's going to be an issue because that's going to be one of the tests is if the thing stays at size four or something and never gets any bigger, that's probably not interesting. Well, if it I'm stays at size four, you don't need to optimize it. I know, but you don't know what size it's going to be at, right? You're just going to return something which is the size count. Look, maybe it's not important yet. I don't know. I mean, and, and, and let me ask another question. If I take a, is the thing restartable in the following sense? If I evolve for five steps and I get an evolution object out, can I feed that evolution object in again as an initial condition? Well, you should be able to feed the final state of that evolution object. Okay, it will be but a convenience. I'm sure it, it, it might be slow right now. There was a bug that imports in large cloud in C++ code was slow and I didn't fix it yet. Okay, all right, but in terms of design, it would be nice if you could feed it in the evolution object as it exists right now and tell it basically how many steps total you want to produce. You see what I'm saying? So that you can then incrementally compute given, you know, let's say you yeah. do a test on size five. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I think that would be highly useful for this actual testing process. Should we change, should we make a comment in the documentation to the effect that one can do that? And then maybe you can, um, where do we have the, uh, where have we put the Wolfram model documentation? It's in code development. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. God, I hate the fact that this always comes up with a, you know, marked as modified. Has I, that I, been? I think that is because it's uh, initially a dynamic, like okay. enabled. They've dynamics. got to fix it. They've got to fix that. Okay. It's just not a, an acceptable thing to have it because it, it, it will mess up. As soon as these are in source control systems, it will guarantee to mess up. Okay. Well, if it's in a source control system that as is, it's going to mess it up anyway because there are outputs from the output cells. Yeah, okay. Yeah, output in any case, cells doesn't, not, okay, all right, yeah. fine. Okay. And oh, for goodness sake, why is that failing? Okay, template input fails on that, on this. Yeah, yeah. We need to report that as a bug mm -hmm. again. And on this one, don't know why. Okay, in any case. Um, okay, so initial conditions. Okay, so by the way, look, look at all the buggy. I mean, can, can we get somebody to like fix this and actually clean it up so that it's got correct typesetting and so on? Yeah, Please, I can do that, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. The initial condition can also be a Wolfram model evolution object. We just say, just writing. Um, Um, and then, then what we're going to assume is that this means T complete generation. So if the evolution object already has 10 generations and you ask for five, it'll give you a truncated evolution object. That makes sense? Max, do you understand? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And obviously also we should support hypergraph as an initial condition and in um, uh, yeah. Oh, by the way, we are going to need, and Ed should produce this, something that makes a canonical hypergraph. Just like we're canonicalizing rules, we also need a canonical hypergraph. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then that's the thing that we should compare with Jonathan's results on 
hypergraph isomorphism. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, well, all right. Um, all right. So, by the end of today, we hope Max is going to have produced what we need for hypergraph plot. We already have what we need for multi rule Wolfram model stuff. Um, I don't know which of the things in this documentation are actually supported right now, and that's something else that we should, um, between Max and Sushma, you should go through. Make sense? Yep. Like, is node naming function supported here? Yes, it is. Good. Okay, but let's go through in detail. I mean, do you want to go through that now with me, or do you want to go through that separately? Which things here are supported? Well, I mean, I can tell you now. The only new things from the last week. Uh, no, I don't want to know the new the... things. I want to know what's not supported okay. from okay. here. Okay. So, what about these? Are these supported? Uh, mostly. So it it's assumes up to automatically. So you can specify generations and events separately. Okay. So should we not? Should we not? Um, I mean, we could just. What should it do if you say T and it can't reach T? Shouldn't it generate a message unless you say up to T, or should we make it effectively be by default up to T? I mean, I think default up to T is fine. Okay. I don't see any reason we necessarily need this message. Okay. All right. Okay, fine. So then let's document that T complete generations. Um, how do I delete that line? I think I just go like this. Okay. Um, oh yeah, you can specify the minimum generation. It always will produce uh, object, you know. I'm sorry, what are you saying? What? You, you cannot specify minimum generation. So you're saying so it always none of these generations from zero to T, yeah. But in the case of states list, you could want this. Yeah. I mean, you can always do it afterwards. Well, I understand that, but not, I mean, at potentially at very high cost. You know, in the case where you want to do a DT that's a thousand, you know, you get what I'm saying? Well, for number of events, not for steps, but, uh, well, maybe. Anyway, I just don't want to do any optimizations ahead of time. No, I understand. But I mean, the question is the syntax and whether we should support, because if we're not going to, I think we should support these in the same way that we do for cellular automaton. A T min, a T max like this. That's what yeah, we do I for I think eventually it could be useful, yeah. Fine. But I mean, so right now, implement it, but don't optimize it, right? So the syntax works, but don't optimize it. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Okay. But I'm not sure it's a priority right now. No, but it's also trivial. It's like one line of code. Well, it's really not trivial. We could also should generate a message if its properties for which this is not supported. Therefore, it needs unit tests and so on. Okay, do we have it, this futurization simple, mechanism? But it took, like, okay, hold hours. on, hold on. Do we have the futurization mechanism yet for function repository documentation? No, we don't. Can we please try to get that? Shouldn't be terribly difficult. Otherwise, we're going to, this is going to be a mess because we're not going to want to remove this, yet we want to have this actually in the function repository. So I, I, I did ask them about that, and they were saying that, you know, it, for now, there is author notes, but B, they want no, to wait that's until... That's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. Let's I already finish. said that's not going to work. We need the mechanism we've already invented, they, the futurization. They are, they are waiting for the uh, docket tools uh, to be productized, and they'll just use that. They'll wait for five years for that. That's not going to work. 
Who's, who's working on that? And how is that, uh, you know, how is that not going to take five years? Mm, I think it's, I think it's a combination of Brian and Jay who are working on that. I don't believe they're doing anything. I, I don't think that's a realistic path. I think that thing is a big hairy mess that's been built up over 25 years and I don't see that happening anytime soon. Okay, I, I'm going to send this as an agenda item for your resource system meeting next week, so. Fine, um, but then make sure that the people involved in the DocuTools prioritization yeah, yeah. are there or available. Otherwise, okay. we'll get into some loop. Yep. Okay. Okay, so, so Max, can we please go through in detail, and probably not right now, which things here are supported and which are not and then we have to figure out what we're going to do with this documentation to indicate what's not supported, given that we want to actually have this show up in the function repository. Am I making sense? Yes. Right, and it's kind of a mess, right, to be saying, we'll take out that line, but we're going to put it back in again later. That's exactly why we have futurization. Well, I see the problem is documentation in the code right now, live in different places. If documentation is in the same source control as the codes, and it's very easy. No, but that's not going to work because it's being part of the function repository. So we know that's not going to work. So let's not go down that path. No, it is going to work because this function repository notebook should be automatically generated from something else. Good and that luck. something else can have futurization it won't mechanism. Work. It won't work. We're not going to get that anytime soon. And we're trying to get this actually to closure in the next two weeks, right? That's a multi-month project to get that to work. So we need a better solution right now. And I think what we'll have to do is have some, you know, something where we put, I don't know, angle brackets around the line and somebody will by hand have to go through every time, take the source of this and strip that out. I mean, maybe we can write a piece of code that does that to take a line. Okay, maybe what we can do, I don't know how to do this because it's going to have to work inside a table and, and put something in that says plus, 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 for example, and strip out every line that, that starts with that. Am I making sense? write a piece of code that does that. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. What? No, I, I'm... Okay. That would be a template notebook from which the actual resource function notebook would be generated. I understand, but we're not going to do it that way because that's too elaborate and too heavyweight and it's, it, it, you know, it's a temporary thing. So what we need to do right now is to do something which is kind of a hack like this where we put this into these notebooks and we why, have... why is it too elaborate? Okay, what are you going to do? How are you going to do this? First of all, well, I insist on being able to edit this. But we're not going to put this in source control where I can't edit it. Okay, so this is going to have to stay in Dropbox. So if you want to, you can have something. I mean, that's another elaborate system that overwrites the source control from the stuff that I have in Dropbox. But I don't think we want to go there. It's not necessary. You know, we've got only a small number of iterations to this file that has to happen. What is this? What is this? Oh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, the, the, the first example I give in the find, uh, sorry, isomorphic hypergraph Q docu uh, documentation page is an instance where Ed's canonicalization code fails. I, it reports them as being, having different okay, canonical that's forms. that's totally pathetic. So maybe oh, Ed's I, stuff is just garbage. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know, because I'm, um, I'm not sure if this was a case it was supposed to deal with. But here we, you can see we have two instances of hypergraphs that are fairly easy to see or isomorphic, but they have different canonical forms. Okay, so that's no good. So feed this back to Ed today, Sushma, please, yep. and ask him what's going on. Because he claimed that, you know, in millions of hypergraphs, he didn't find ones that, I mean, so maybe that's just nonsense. Okay, in, in Ed's defense, since he isn't here, I, I, did, I did intentionally pick cases which I knew would like stump a lot of canonicalizers for the documentation because I wanted to show that my algorithm worked. But, I, so I don't know if this is a case he anticipated, but. Okay. Um, okay. 
And actually, a lot of, now that I'm looking, a lot of the other examples also lead to different canonical forms under Ed's canonicalizer. Well, that's not very encouraging, is it? It makes it suggest that it's complete nonsense, which is bad because we're using, we, we need to use some canonicalizer to decide how to make the hash codes for rules. Am I making it, sense? If you want, I mean, okay, so w when you said you, you tried my thing and it was really, really slow, I mean, was it prohibitively slow or just slower than Ed's? Well, it will be prohibitively slow to find a canonical form because it's got to find how is it going to, it's just an isomorphism tester. Right. So, so, um, so, so Ed's canon, the, the, okay, I think there's conceivably something I could do that would be a hybrid of the two. Ed's canonicalizer is, is quite nice in the sense that it's, uh, it, you know, it's compact. All it seems to be doing is it's, it, it, you, you know, you, you take an individual hypergraph and you, you order it by the length of the hyper edges and then you just do, you, you get a list of the variables that appear and then you just do the canonical, you know, you do slash dot and you, and you give each one an, a, an order, you, you do a replacement on that list and then the range of the uh, length of variables. So it tries to find the first canonical one under the default enumeration. Yeah. I could build something that basically did that and then actually tested that they were isomorphic. And if they weren't, you know, tried the next possible uh, assignment of variables. Um, I don't know. So if you're saying his thing defines an ordering. And the only question is, in that ordering, you're saying that he is enumerating conceivably isomorphic hypergraphs. Right, exactly. But it's not exhaustive. Um, well, and then it's, that's not going to be good enough because it might not find the minimal one. If it's not exhaustive, there may be a minimal one, which is in fact earlier in the list than any that he has, but he didn't find it. I, okay, so what, what I'm going to try and do is just link up what I have to Ed's code. And then, you know, if, if it finds a thing that it thinks is a candidate isomorphic hypergraph, but it turns out it's not isomorphic, uh, it will then just look for the kind of the next possible element in the, the, yeah, the I think that, I think the key problem is Ed's code assumes that the first thing that looks plausible in the enumeration is the isomorphic hypergraph. And it wouldn't be that hard to just add a test. And if it fails that test, look for the next. No, but I understand that. But, but you're saying that Ed has overgenerated conceivably isomorphic hypergraphs. Is that true? That within Ed's enumeration of conceivably isomorphic hypergraphs is the minimal isomorphic hypergraph. True or not true? Uh, I don't understand the code well enough to say. Okay, well, so that's what we have to determine from Ed. But in, in other words, if he is doing sampling of the space of potentially isomorphic hypergraphs, he might just miss the one which is in fact the minimal isomorphic hypergraph. Yes, I mean, if, that, if that's what he's doing, yes. Right, so we need to find that out from him. He said he will be working on this this weekend, so we should send mail to him about this. Now. Yeah, I'm writing an email. The... Okay. Okay. So, look, another area we know we need. So, I mean, with respect to this, are we going to have what we need to start doing searches in this world from model code? I think the answer is yes, so far as I know. Yes, I think so. Okay. All right. So then the next question is the parameterization of updating orders. Okay, what do we think we're going to do about that? I mean, that's otherwise known as, I don't know, is it gauge transformations? Is it choices of foliations? What do, how do we think about it? And then what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of options, um, you know, what, what kind of options can we give? And then once we have some interesting or potentially interesting um, rule, how do we explore it with respect to different updating orders? Well, I think the general case is to give it uh, the function that would compare matches. And I think we actually already documented this. The function that would compare matches. What does that mean? Well, if you have multiple matches, it should determine which one would go first. I see, I see, I see. Okay, and how would it determine that? Well, I mean, it's good at different things. So, for one thing, it's given the list of indices. 
for matched expressions, so it could peak between those. Oh, wait a minute. Node update function applies the function to the complete list of possible matches, returning the match to actually use. Yeah, that's the most general one, but it's not very scalable. Right, but so I'm asking, in the world of gauge transformations and so on, can we make a correspondence between these orderings and standard sort of coordinate systems with respect to the foliations or gauge trans uh, choices so, of gauge? So I, th I think, okay, one way to think about this is that the, the way of defining an update order is some pure function, which if you're given a, a node in a hypergraph, you know, gives you back a number corresponding to which branch of the hypergraph to, to, to traverse next. Is that a reasonable statement? Mm, no, I mean, you've got a bunch of right. candidate matches. Look, you've got a bunch right. of sub hypergraphs right. so, that so, were so identified. The yeah. function, which uh, used to be called set cases and in Tony's code is, is subset cases, will have some canonical order for you know, possible matches between rules. So if you know that order relation, all you need to know is basically a number which says, if you're at this point in our hypergraph, you know, which, which path do I go down? I don't understand that. I, at a given time, when a given state of the hypergraph, there are some sub-hypergraphs that are identifiable. Mm -hmm. Right, and, so, okay. and so, 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 so subset cases will give you, or set cases will give you a list of those with some order relation, with, with, some, with, with some ordering, I should say, okay? Sure. So, so then for each, for each match, there is just an integer. And so, so all you need to know is, I'm at this point in the multiway system. What integer should I use in, you know, that defines this replacement rule? And basically what that's asking is, which direction do I go down in the, in the, in the multiway system? Sure, sure, sure. You're so, saying that in the, in the list of hypergraph matches, yes. there is a, a current ordering of the list of hypergraph matches. Yes. And what you can do is say, I want number 17 in that list of hypergraph matches. Precisely, if I am at this point in the, in the multiway system. And that point what in the multiway That point, because the point is defined, I mean, the, the set of matches will be completely different at different points in the multiway system. Right, exactly. So what you want is a function which takes in a, a vertex of the multiway system and outputs a, an integer. No, I, I agree, I doesn't. agree. But the, the right. point is, what I'm asking is, in the aggregate, right? So, so Max has a, what, what would you call your current criterion, Max? Your current updating criterion? How would you name it? Is it first, is it um, uh, oldest first or something? It's least, least recent first. Okay. So let's say, so then, um, Okay. I mean, so there are subtleties to it. Possible, possible settings for node update function include. Well, it should really be a list of sorting functions. And right now it's least recent first, then uh, permutation. Uh, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, so the first thing we have is least recent first and then what's the what's the another one then permutation what does that mean well if we have the same subset of expressions it should it picks the smallest permutation of those same subset of expressions what do you mean by that how does it know the indices of the I mean, permutation? It, it tries to match expressions in the set in the same order that the rule inputs are So the set is three two three one three one two, and the rule input is A B C. It would match, you know, A to three, B to one, and C to two. two. I see. Okay. So so I see. So. And if not possible, we'll pick the smallest permutation of those. But wait a minute. But it, this is an ordered hypergraph. Why did, why is there a permutation allowed? No permutation of expressions, not atoms. You're saying a permutation of the elements in the set of the of yes. the hyper edges. Yes. Um, we're hearing a lot of clicking, by the way. 
Okay, oh, sorry, so sorry. you're saying hyper edge, this is basically lowest hyper edge permutation. Yes. I don't completely understand. Okay, so least recent first is one choice. And I understand this one sort of, but I'm asking the question, does that cost, does least recent first, if we were thinking about this in terms of PDEs and initial value problems and all that kind of stuff, what does least recent first correspond to? I'm not sure I understand what does it have to do with PDEs. Because the choice, this is defining a foliation in, or alternatively, it's defining you know, it's defining a path in the multi-way system, AKA, can, can, a, what's that? Can I, can I finish what I was saying earlier? Yeah. Uh, so, so what I was trying to say was, in effect, what's happening is because, because we know that each, um, each vertex in the multi-way system, you know, has, it, it has a, either a single or, or a collection of um, vertex, you know, vertices leading into it, which are updating events. So what it's really doing is it's, if you think about this in, in terms of the bulk space-time, is for each space-time event, it's, it's, it's uh, the, uh, up to the, this function that takes a vertex of the multi-way system, gives you back an integer corresponding to a branch, is really saying, for a given space-time event, what is the relativistic four vector that gets you to the next event you know, in, this, in this time evolution, right? Mm. Yes. Okay. That's your that's your ADM formalism rearing right. its head again. Right. Exactly. So so what's happened? So so the particular branch that you pick for a given space type for a given event, uh, you know, under the standard way of foliating these things, you split that up into a time like component, which is the mm -hmm. lapse, and the space like component, which is the shift. But in principle, you can represent the whole thing as just a single uh, four vector, which is in effect what this is it, for the multi way case. Well. There isn't a four vector in the sense that we don't have a you know a manifold erected here. It's a what is it? It's a well, it's a, it's a mapping from space time event to space time event. So for, g given a particular space, g given a particular event, what's the next event in this? Yeah, time I understand. Evolution? And and we're hoping that in the in the bulk case, as I say, where you have a for a sufficiently large causal network, that will just be a four vector, which is the alpha beta i thing in ADM. Um, so so the that that function that maps. Hyper, uh, multi way vertices onto these numbers is your gauge in effect. Okay, let's walk through that for a second. The multi way, in the multi way system, you can take any path you want. Right, in effect, the multi way system is the set of all possible gauge choices somehow. Yeah. And where does that show up in standard formalism? Well, I. I haven't personally seen it, but if you if you were to just represent a if you were to represent a space of all possible uh, space time it's, foliations corresponding to different gauge choices, that's in effect what it would be. It would be. A, why isn't it the big diffeomorphism group thingy? It I mean, would be. Oh. It would be a diffeomorphism group in the case of GR. Yes. Okay. So our analog of the diffeomorphism group is this thing about. I mean, one feature of of that. What is our analog? We have, what is our analog of invariance under the diffeomorphism group? That, that is causal invariance, I think. Diffeomorphism invariance is causal invariance for, for a multi-way system. Let me try to understand that. So in a sense, the different paths in the multi-way system correspond to different elements, different elements of the diffeomorphism group, applying Going, is it the case that following a, a particular um, path in the multi-way system corresponds to, is it true that every, I don't think it's quite right, that every, um, uh, every step in the following of the multi-way system, it's not quite the same as saying that corresponds to applying some element to the diffeomorphism group? Is it not? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I mean, then it's, if that's the case. Sorry. In, in, the, in the case of the special relativity derivation, we, can, we assume that that's true under the case of relativistic coordinate transformations. What we're now talking about is, the, is general covariance, where it should be invariant under all coordinate transformations. 
Right. So right. one question would be for the string case, can we actually formulate this in terms of some, you know, finite group theory thing? Yes, no. I can. I, yeah. Can, can we find discrete analogs of the diffeomorphism group? Exactly. I, 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 can, I can look for that if you want. Um, well, I'm not sure how important it is, but it seems like that's an interesting analog there is um, for a given, you know, for a string rewrite system, it should be the case that the set of possible paths yeah, I mean, I think it is right. I think that is true that the... Yes, I, I think... The, the, for something like the sorting, you know, for the string sub rewrite system that is just sorting, AB goes to BA, you know, that one, right? Yes. I, I think... Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I, th I think the correct way to think about, or a, a correct way to think about this is... Uh, Causal invariance is a much stronger condition than just Lorentz invariance, because Lorentz invariance is effectively saying, if, you know, if we define a metric on the causal network and you only take kind of straight slices, so to speak, we have invariance. Yeah, I, know. Of the I understand. So, so, so the causal invariance is actually much closer to general covariance, which is, you know, invariance under diffeomorphism group. And so I think it has to be the case that different branches of the multi-way system, therefore, correspond to different elements of some discrete version of the diffeomorphism group. Okay, but so if we in fact have that discrete diffeomorphism group, we can look at other properties of that group. For example, what is the significance of the Cayley graph of that group? I don't know, but we can, we can find out. Well, I mean, but, but so, so what we're saying is this, this thing that has where there are elements of the group that are being applied and things happen and so on and so on and so on. There is an overall invariance group that is some kind of invariance of the causal network. Right. What is the transformation? So given that we have the causal network, bloomp, it's a, it's a big graph. What does this group, there is some sense in which that it's it's a no. I'm sorry. It's not the causal network. It's the multi-way network, which is has this invariance, right? It's the multi-way network. The complete multi-way network is the thing that's supposed to have invariance under this group. Uh, is that true? I thought it, I think I thought it was that. I okay. My understanding was it was more the case that what we have is some action of like a symmetric group on the causal network. And so we're saying that, you know, under the action of this group, the causal network remains isomorphic. Well, I'm not sure. But uh, by the way, this reminds me, did we finish the visualization of the joint multi-way system and uh, causal network? The causal network of the multi-way system. I don't think we finished that visualization, did we? Who was looking at that? Do you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. That was the thing I was working on, and then you told me that you and Max had done it in a meeting that I wasn't part of. So I'm not okay, sure what we better thing. look at that. Okay, uh, you know what? I need to get some food. I, I will rejoin this meeting in just a second. Okay, hold on a second. Hi again. All right, we were going to look at this multi-way meets causal graph. Guys, there? I'm here. I think Jonathan mentioned he's going to be back in a second. Yeah, okay. I'm here. Okay. Okay. Multi way system. All right. So we had had. And I don't know what's being rewritten in this file because there's stuff that um, there's the refactoring of this multi-way system code to have a, essentially a multi-way wrapper on arbitrary evolution. Maybe we should wait for Jonathan here because then what I, I, Jonathan I, I, had, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, what, was, what was the question? I, the question was, um, we had discussed making essentially a general multi-way wrapper around arbitrary evolution code. Right. Okay. And refactoring this to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Which I don't think is super difficult. Um, but now you had got 
multi-way system for Wolfram model evolution? Well, I, I have the equivalent of the evolution graph for multi-way system. You, you have a bunch of other stuff in multi-way system, which I haven't looked at or used. But Okay, but if we have an API, basically, for an arbitrary underlying evolution, we mm -hmm. should be able to support all those features in the multi-way system package that way. Sure. Um, okay, but one of the key things here was this thing here. And I forget where we got stuck with this. We wanted to label the... Um, Yeah, we needed to label the events separately from the states, right? right. I don't remember who was working on that. Did, was that Max? Were you working on this somehow? Well, it's... Well, I didn't work on it yet, but it is in the to-do list. Okay. In whose to-do list? In yours? Well, we don't have assignment specifications in the to-do list. It's in the global to-do list. Okay. Well. Okay, but look. What do we need here? Um, I mean... Something like this evolution plot could perfectly well be generalized. Um, yeah, all it needs is a sorting function for Wolfram model states, aka hypergraphs, to be able to draw this. Right, and EdPeg already has implicitly a sorting function for hypergraphs. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's some features here which are somewhat specific to strings. But, you know, like the way that we can draw these, um, well, like here, okay. So how each state is obtained from others. So that's just a layered graph on top of, um, you know, an evolution relation, basically. Yes. I mean, that, that is the multi-way system, sort of. Well, it's a representation of it. Right. Um, what do we think of? I mean, in terms of multi-way system, what, is, what are the mathematical analogs of this thing? What is it? I mean, was that to me or? No, yeah, anybody. I mean, okay. Well, I, I, I think you already know my view on this, which is that it's basically a proof graph. When when you're doing when you're dealing with sort of abstract term rewriting systems, the you know the the, the network of all possible proofs is basically just the network of all possible transformations applied yeah, to the expression. So it's a proof graph. And, and the methods for finding critical pairs and determining confluence and things are exactly the same as in both cases. No, I, I agree with that. I'm talking about in algebra, for example. What's the analog of this thing? Um, well, it's the, it's the network of, okay, in the, in the context of universal algebra, it's just the network of possible, of, of words that are equivalent to a given word in a group, for instance. Yes. by applying generators where yes, each exactly. rule applies generators right because you know every word problem word problems and theorems in abstract rewrite systems are you know isomorphic in some sense mm -hmm. and so, there's, a, there's, an, there's an associated analog with loop theory that's a little bit more convoluted but it's again identical what is loop theory 
it's a branch of universal algebra that deals okay. with that, that kind of loop. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder whether I talk about this somehow here, because I think I did think about this. Um, what the hell is a multidimensional multiway system? Hmm. That's just pointing out that, yeah. Okay. Representations with generalized versions. Okay. Wait a minute. There's something missing here. That must have a character missing. That's disappointing. Let's find out what it is. Okay. Hold on. Oh, for goodness sake. That's a null string, double quote, somehow got dropped. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yep. So I'll put that. I thought this had been proofread. Okay, let's just read through what, what was claimed here. So what is the analog um, what does it mean for causal invariance if the thing is a semi-group or a group or anything like that? And also what does it mean for your time reversal stuff to say that it's a semi-group? I think it makes them cause an invariant. If it's a semi-group. Yes. An interesting claim. Well, because you cannot have, uh, let's see. Well, but it's- You can go from any state to any other state. What? No, you can't. In a given evolution. So a question here. Um, so is a semi-group Rewriting system, rewriting set of semi group uh, emulating rewriting system causal invariant. We just tested empirically for one of these cases. So, for example, in this case here, um, um, so we, if we just make a multi-way system, you're sending me something. Uh, I think it's a proof of the claim we want. If you, I mean, look at the final sentence of the abstract. It was nice when people have already figured these things out. Yeah, so what I was going to say was that, um, in effect, I think confluence is the thing that distinguishes a, a, a loop from a semi-group. Because 
if you have a so a, a, a loop has identity but not necessarily associativity and the purpose of Knuth-Bendix completion is in effect as Max says to introduce associativity okay When is this paper from? 2010, I think. Okay, a semi tui system <clears throat> is otherwise known as a string rewrite. Right, right, exactly. I got a lot of trouble to establish that. Okay. All right. Let's see this in action, though. So if we go here and we just evaluate this. Now, if I say, let's do reverse that. And now what I'm supposed to be saying is I want one of these, which, which thing do I want? I want one of these. Is that right? What do I want to have? I want to, I want to get the causal graph of this. If I'm not mistaken. And from that, okay. Explain to me what I have to do here. Do you understand what I have to do? That's extremely uninteresting. How do we see this result? Well, do we have confidence checking for strings? The uh, I, I do, but I'm not sure whether it's in the code that you guys are using. Okay, what that, sorry. What would that function be? If you want my confluence checker, it's causally invariant Q. And where is that? Uh, there are two versions. One, the, the earlier stable version is in Jonathan's stuff. The later unstable version is in Talks. Oh, how did your talk go anyway? I never even heard about it. Boom. Did people show up and ask physics questions or did they ask more technical questions? Max? I think they mostly ask physics questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any particularly interesting ones? Well, what do you think, John? I mean, you answer in most of those questions. Uh, uh, like I said, I think, I think Jose's question about um, time reversibility was the most interesting one. Uh, which we then uh, yeah. afterwards had a long discussion about. Um, okay. I don't remember what the other ones were, which possibly indicates they weren't interesting. Okay. All right. Anyway. <clears throat> all right. What are all these functions and how do they relate to... Um, okay. Again, let's go back to our summary. Okay. So you have apparently a bunch of additional functions here, right? I think they are listed in the function summary. If you, I, I forget where exactly, but I saw them somewhere. Okay, network proof. Okay, that, that's not that's not listed because I'm still act. That's still under active R and D. That's the right. so on stringy writing. What what we've got overlap free strings, but what do we have here? Well, ca causally invariant Q, find critical pairs, find unresolved critical pairs, and find uh, Bendix completion works both for Wolfram models and for strings. Okay. And they all use internally my own multi-way system evolution. 
for Wolfram models and for strings. Okay, so hold on a sec. So you're saying, okay, so checking this off. And again, what's the state of committing these to the function repository? And what's uh, the API that they require from the underlying evolution functions? Oh, shit, I've got to go something. Um, I lost, wait a minute. Oh, no, no, I'm off by an hour. Never mind. Um, this middle schoolers? Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> The, um, we'll see how many of them are off by an hour. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. In any case, um, sorry. What is the API that your functions use to the evolution function? Uh, right now, it's there's for the string case nothing. I mean, that's my own string evolution. Um, for the Wolfram model evolution, uh, for, you know, for producing the multi-way system for that, the the reason I'm reticent to do it is I want to make sure a I want to make sure we have compatibility with the multi-way system function that you guys have been developing, and b my issue is that uh, right now my multi-way system evolution for Wolfram models doesn't use any Wolfram model code. Um, it uses uh, subset replace and subset cases. And that seems wrong somehow. Which and, comes from where? That's in uh, Tony Schindler's graph store uh, context. And it feels a little bit bizarre that our, um, our check for Lorentz invariance relies on code that was developed for Sparkle queries. I guess Sparkle and what we are doing is very similar. I was mentioning before. Yeah. But anyway, until we have something analogous to the subset cases function, uh, I think that's basically all I can do. Okay. Well, so hold on. Let me just um um. So you're saying in graph store subset cases. I think it's it's graph store backtick subsets backtick subset cases. Hmm. It's it's deeply nested. <laughs> All right, well, can we need to import it? Can we expose that in the in the function repository? I think what? there is a plan to expose that. For twelve point one, at least I see ILG tickets function. for that. Yeah, I, I I see ILG tickets for that. Okay, what is the function then? Uh, subset, subset cases. cases, subset position, subset count, and subset replace. Although Max did bring up the very good point that that's a weird naming scheme, given that you don't call the you don't call string cases substring cases. Yeah, but set cases, okay. Okay, hold on. So these are, so you're saying, but we also have a thing called subsets. And we have a thing called sequence. Wait a minute. We have things like, subset map and what's the analog here so so you're saying for 12.1 and you're saying there's a subset cases uh, do you think there's documentation for this mm, good point let me see i can at least find the agenda that they had for ild when they brought this up with you and i have to confirm that this is for 12.1 i'm all i'm saying is i see a ticket i don't know well, let's see whether we can make sure of this since i think we care and want it okay let's take a look here oh that's not encouraging okay so you got to go track that down 
-hmm. Okay. But so, again, again, look, we've got to have it be the case. What What is the API for the evolution function? We, we've got to have something which, which has in here, I mean, am I going to have to do this code refactor on this? I mean, I could do it, but it seems. <sighs> I mean, as much as I remember, we, when we talked about this last time, you mentioned the refactoring part can be done later on. We could clean up whatever we have right now and submit to function repository and the generalized case can go. All right, fine. But but then, <clears throat> then what we have to do, okay. The question is, um, I mean, in here, we've got all the string replace part stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Is this yours? Max, I've forgotten. Oh, let's see. I think this is yours. Yes, I think so. Yes, it is. Hmm. So some of these, it has deeply burnt in. I see, this is your code. This is not my code. Um, But so some of this stuff, it really doesn't depend on the underlying evolution, does it? I think so. You think it does not depend? Well, the character uh, evolution definitely does depend on it. Yes. OK, so look, it seems to me that it's something for you to try and unscramble this and to try and make this a bit more general. And then, hopefully, for our evolutions, and again, I'm saying this for like the fifth time, we need an API for what aspects of the evolution we get put into, you know, find critical pairs, you know, causal invariant queue, all these kinds of things. Right. What aspect of the evolution do they need to know? All I need, to, as I said, all I need is the evolution graph. I have code for doing that in the string case and the minimal model case. Um, all you need is which graph? The, uh, the evolution graph. I, I need the combinatorial structure of the multiway system. That's all. Okay, you don't need information about the events. I mean, I, need I, to... I need to know what I need to know what the in, I don't need to know information about the rewrite events. No, I need to know what uh, you know, what each state actually is. But other than that, the edges can be unlabeled. Okay, but so what needs information about the events? The causal graph, I believe. Okay, and the full. Graph, the full graph from which we can derive everything is the mixed evolution and causal graph, correct? Given that graph, is it a true statement that we can derive everything? Uh, we can certainly derive well, everything. In that right? case, I need chart character level graph, which has more information. Okay, the analog of the character level graph for the hypergraphs is what? Well, it's a multi-way system. Uh, well, it's an optimized version of the multi-way system you were talking about before. And what's way optimized? I mean, it, it contains information about how every hypergraph... But it's a local multi-way system. That is, it's it's the same as. Uh, let's see. Well, it's all expressions producing all branches with related event information, and so on. Okay. I'm, I'm a little confused by this. I mean, so you're saying if we had a generator that generates either the evolution graph or the evolution plus causal graph, that all other properties like the causal invariance information and so on can be deduced from that graph, correct? 
I'm reticent, I'm reticent to say all, but as I said, all, all the properties that I currently have functions for can be deduced from that, and we don't even need the causal part. Okay. All right. Well, so, okay. So to me, okay, let's, let's see. go ahead. I don't know how do you produce causal graph if you don't have uh, expression level information. We can't. I mean, that's not what Jonathan is saying. Jonathan is saying is his functions, like causal invariant Q, don't depend on the causal graph. Right. They just tell you things about the causal graph, but the, yeah, they don't actually generate it and don't require it. Right. So, okay, okay, look, I think what we need to do, okay, so first priority for Max is to do the hypergraph plot stuff, which is a today type thing. I think it seems to me like the next priority is the refactor of the multi-way system stuff. Because otherwise we're, we're stuck. We can't put in Jonathan's stuff, right? Am I making sense? Yes, no, you maybe. Mean generalization to arbitrary systems. Yes, that's what I mean. And if you want, I mean, I, I could probably do this or I could work with somebody to do it. If we think there are going to be a bunch of design decisions to be made, I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, what we've got here, we need a case of this. Okay, what I need to know is, in here, yeah, I mean, this should be a very straightforward thing in terms of the Wolfram model function, shouldn't it? No, not quite, it, not quite, it, it's something different. It's subset cases and so on, right? because it's doing all possible rewrites. And you don't, right. do you have a way to do that in your code, Max? Not right now. Okay, well, Jonathan, do you have a way to do that using Tony's stuff? Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you open any of my functions, you'll see there's a, there's a find multi-way evolution graph function for Wolfram model rules that does Okay, that. well, let's look at that. Let's look at that, let's look at that. <clears throat> okay, where is that now? Uh, well, okay, yeah, if you want a relatively recent version, it's a, there's one in talks, but it may it may not be stable. What 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 does it what is it called? For? Causally, call, any of them. They they all have this function. Causally invariant Q will do. So I have some stuff to handle the string cases, and then uh, yeah. So find multi-way evolution graph. Okay, so this is the case for strings, right? Well, the Wolfram model case isn't documented, but it is in the code. Okay. Uh, so if you look at the case where it's find multi-way evolution graph where rules are the form list goes to list, it does that. And then I have a, there's a separate pre-processing step, which I'm not, um, which may not be in this version, which just does the, Collapsing of vertices if they are if they correspond to isomorphic hypergraphs. So you claim that this here There's a little bit of hackiness because uh, Tony's function does something a little bit weird when it does replacements, but um, Well, so that needs to be fixed if we're going to make it a system function presumably Sure, but that's my hacky workaround is what subset replace new does. Okay, and how does a subset replace new relate to Wolfram model? Well, subset replace new is trying to do what um, subset, what set replace does. It's the, the, the there's a slight um, difficulty, which is that when Tony's function does subset replace, it seems to wrap the bit that it was replaced in, a, in, in, a, in an additional set of braces, which is a bit strange. Um, well, we should, okay, so that should be parameterized, presumably to have a function that is the wrapping function. Right, right. Exactly. The identity, and so we should tell that to Tony. Yes, okay. All 
Okay, come on, we got to unscramble this. So this function you say, if I give some So down here, by the way, you've got a causal invariant. What what is that three doing? That's telling. So because causal invariance is undecidable in general, it, it it's it's really asking if we evolve the multiway system for three iterations, is the evolution causally invariant? Hmm. So that's just a property of a causal graph. Why why aren't you just looking at the? Oh, I'm sorry, it's, the it's evolution. Not, it's not a property. Graph. It's a Sorry, what were you saying? It's not a pro yeah, it's a property of the multiway system. It's determining that of the critical pairs that exist after three iterations, do any of them remain unresolved? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. From that initial condition, so it's it's asking causal invariance of evolution from that specific initial condition. Correct. But aren't there cases where you can have provable causal invariance where that third argument could be infinity? Yes, yes, which is why I'm developing fine network proof to deal with the provable case. Okay, so in fact, causal invariant Q will often have just two arguments. And we'll go off and chug off and chug and find this proof. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it can do. But your your current idea is to have something where you generate a proof object, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um. And I mean, in effect, all that it's doing is it's it's calling the analog of find equational proof on this on the rewrite operation, and we're trying to prove or disprove associativity of the of that rewrite operation. Why is is associativity obviously equivalent to causal invariance? Well, that, that was what we were discussing. That was the that was the paper I sent you. So this claim is claim is that associativity of what operation of the of the re, of the abstract replacement operation the the arrow as a, as considered as a binary operator i see is equivalent to confluence is that the claim Yep, I believe so. Okay, so let's understand what that means. So that means that if I have something like A arrow B arrow C, that that's equivalent to hmm, that that's equivalent to a R O B R O C. Now, do I believe that? That says, isn't that a much stronger condition? What does this even mean? What does this mean? Oh, sorry. Hang on. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. One very important point of clarification. It's the it's actually the I think it's the transitive reflexive closure of the abstract replacement operation. Okay, what do we mean by this? So, so what you're really saying is, if there exists a rewrite sequence that takes A to B, then the, the, then there exists a rewrite sequence that takes that to C. That's equivalent to saying, if there exists a rewrite sequence that, that takes B to C, there is a rewrite sequence that takes A to that. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think that's a pretty obvious statement in terms of the structure of the graph. Yeah, so it's it's the ref it's associativity of the reflexive transitive closure of the abstract rewrite operation. Sorry. Why are you okay. saying reflexive transitive closure? 
uh, because it's a reflexive operation. Is this statement interesting or is this statement kind of trivial? Well, it's kind of the definition of confluence in the most general sense. Yeah. So it's trivial in that sense. Okay, let me understand this again. When we look at the graph, okay, so let's imagine that we have a A, B goes to B, A, B, A goes to A, B. And let me say, okay, looking at that, what property of that network is the property we're now talking about? Because this is an example of a causal invariant set of rewrites, correct? Right. So what property is this? Is it that we're now describing here? It's really a way of saying critical pair convergence. It's saying that if there are, um, yeah, if, if there are two states in that multi-way system that can both be reached, then we can reach a common state from those two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just very quickly, looking at this. So the claim is that for a semigroup. What is the claim here? The claim is that if it's a semigroup, then what? Well, if, if the if the structure is a semigroup under the action of the replacement operation, then it's it's confluent. It's strongly confluent, I think. Okay. Is there anything special if it's a group? Um. Well, if it's in if if it's invertible, that's kind of time reversal, I guess. Yeah. Well, but invertibility is what you already get in a semigroup. Every relation has a reverse relation, and even in a semigroup. Right. Right. Okay. Let's look at what I claim about Cayley graphs. Well, the next thing I claim here is that. What we're always doing is to look at, given an initial, um, we're looking at what the connected component is. You know, in group theory, this whole thing, if these are generators of the group, this whole thing is just the, you know, pieces equivalent to a single element. Right? So in other words, different initial conditions correspond to, in other words, the whole evolution of the universe, so to speak, it's just an equivalent, you know, it's just kind of the working out of the equivalence relation of its initial conditions. Right. By the way, sorry, you, you don't have inverses in a semigroup. That's an inverse semigroup. You just have associativity. No, I, I, I know, but you have yeah, yeah. in the semi 2 e system business. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah right. it's a 2 e system in the sense that every rewrite has a reverse rewrite. Right. But I, yeah, my, my point was I don't think you get anything interesting from the identity existence yeah so the, only I, the only interesting case going from semi groups to groups is invertibility anyway sorry i just want to, want but, to make there's that a point. there's already invertibility of the semi two e rules even getting to a semi group sure okay okay all right so this point about how the initial condition you know basically the elements of one of these algebraic objects you know, the elements, e.g., of a semigroup. The distinct elements of the semigroup are ones that cannot be reached. Now, I'm now confused here. If you can reach something using the generators, 
Yeah, that's, you want to know what are the inequivalent elements that cannot be reached by the generators. Is that right? Do, do, do you get what I'm asking? And then, In the Cayley graph, well, I mean, in the Cayley graph, you're, you're asking, I mean, the edges are the equivalent elements with respect to the generators, right? Wait a second, the edges? Because you have an edge, whenever you have, an, whenever you have an element and that element times a generator, they're connected by an edge. Yeah, what's the relationship between the Cayley graph and the multi-way graph? And the multi-way evolution graph. I think they are equivalent. I'm just wondering now about exactly how, like, what does it mean when they when branches reconverge? Does that necessarily mean the same thing? I'm not sure. So let, let's take the example that I make here that AB goes to BA, that that has a grid as its semi as its Cayley graph. So that would suggest that this thing here, the states graph, I believe, is the Cayley graph. Am I mistaken here? Let's find out what this looks like. Hmm. That's not looking the way I would expect. So this is claiming that AB goes to BA. Is a grid. I'm now totally confused about what. Oh, I thought that might happen. So every, every possible sequence of how many elements this is, six elements, all two to the six possible ones of those should be reachable eventually. Okay, how many elements are there here? There seem to be 20 different elements here, which is just totally weird. So what happens if I just start this off with A, 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 A? Oh, it's just sorting. Not nothing. Right, so it's just, it has to be, so what I need there is A, 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 B, B, B. Okay, so then I get that. So I have to have equal numbers of A's and B's. What is this thing? relative to, so I make the claim. Free semi-group. Okay, what's the analog of the free semi-group in terms of string rewrites? And when this is claiming that so strings of generators with A's and B's in different orders are equivalent. No, this isn't the same thing. This is not the same thing. No, I mean, like, this is the problem. So in one case, we're dealing with 
concatenation being the operator of uh, the uh, front the binary operation and in the other case we're dealing with replacement being the binary operation I think okay getting... okay 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 so wait a minute so the Cayley graph Cayley graph comes when we are operating w when we are applying a concatenation operator right so the so the free semigroup is the is the is the case where you have all possible strings of a's and b's exactly and, and we have concatenation yes. as the binary operation what we're talking about here and the reason i was a little bit confused about what we were doing is this is we're talking about an algebra here where the replacement operation is the binary operation right Cayley group comes when we're applying a concatenation operator to get to a new element to get to a potentially new element of the group right Cayley graph no of the group oh Cayley yeah. graph okay. Um, modding out by the these graphs, which are essentially by the multi-way states graph, basically associated with that new element. Right. Okay. So in fact, these things, are, but now. The Cayley graph represents, so a Cayley graph effectively represents a map of inequivalent initial conditions, I claim. Yes, yes. Um, and so what? I mean, so that means I mean, in this case, that's presumably just A, B. A, A, I mean, A and B. What do you mean? Because we can generate any... But if concatenation is our binary operation, we can generate any initial condition modulo the state's graph. No, it's, okay. it's a count of the number of... In, in the case of this one here, it's a count of the number of A's and the number of B's. That's the Cayley graph. Right? Because every, if there are N A's and M B's, then this is saying that all of the orderings are equivalent. Right? So the only thing that matters is the count of the number of A's and the number of B's, which is why the Cayley graph is a grid, a two dimensional grid, right? Right. Right. Okay. Um, okay, the Cayley graph with randomly chosen underlying rules. Okay, so this is the whole business of what does the Cayley graph look like? What does that, how does that relate to what we're doing? And what is the analog of this? The concatenation operation for strings, what's the analog of that for hypergraphs? I mean, Join. look, what's that? Join? Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I guess you're adding an arbitrary hyper edge or node. It's just some attachment of a new node or a new hyper edge to the hypergraph. Okay. Well, all right, at least we understand this note here. I wonder whether that note has anything interesting to say. Formal languages and multi-way systems.
that's just saying that you can view it as a as a generator and the acceptor would be running it the other way so that's all right yeah all right okay look we, we should probably let max get back to work and we should all go on our separate ways but is is so i think we have a um do we have a fairly clear set of priorities i mean my next priority is to do some searches and to continue writing the basic description of these models and some blog post type stuff about them okay so we need to put a lot of things in the function repository we need to refactor a bunch of stuff here what did we conclude about the subset we we concluded that for that multi-way evolution of a wolfram model was achieved using subset cases correct in in for my code yes yeah but i mean what, what don't we need look look what we need to have be the case is that there is a function that is called multi-way system. Now, I don't think having rules, having lists there is all that hot. I think we should probably have this because I think otherwise we'll get tangled up with various kinds of things. Something like that. And it's got an initial condition as well, right? So you claim, you claim you have code that will generate, but you don't have it hooked up to evolution plot. And part of the reason you don't have it hooked up to evolution plot is not clear what to put in the nodes of the evolution plot. Well, it was also because I wasn't the one working on multi-way systems. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to do anything that might conflict with what you guys were working on. I understand. I understand. But again, we just need the thing that look, look, Given a state, what is the API? Given a state, get a list of all new states. Okay, okay, let, let, let's write down, let's write down what. Okay, so first thing is we need um, a state evolution function. Right, given a, Given a state, get a list of all new states, correct? We need, okay, hold on a second, what this is. This is, we've got multi-way systems 02, so let's call it multi-way systems 03-API, okay? So next thing is a state equivalence function. Given two states, are they equivalent? Right? Right. Um, well, actually, probably what we want is a state union function. I mean, that, that's a subcase of the state union function. Correct. Given a list of states, what is the union taking account of equivalence? Okay. So this for strings is the fairly trivial string replace list, I believe. Is that not correct? I think so. Okay, so what we want is the state evolution function for a Wolfram model. So for strings, this is simply string. Yeah, it's, it's well, actually what it is, it appears to be 
flatten a strewn replaced list of state comma rules. Do you agree? So for example, let's do this case as an example. Well, it's rather a silly case, actually, because we, we, we've got, yeah. I think that's correct in that case, right? Okay, so for Wolfram models, aka hypergraph replacements, what is the analogous code? Well, we need set replace list. I thought Jonathan had this in terms of Tony's functions. I do. You can get it. It's um well, it, it's in causally invariant Q. Okay, so maybe what we need is to have a thing, either put it into Wolfram model, which may or may not be a good idea. I think that's going to get super confusing if it's using Tony's code. Well, what would it be called here? This is um, what which what will we call this? I mean, this is multi way. I don't know. This is kind of wolf multi way wolf model step or something. But, but what we need is just that single piece of code, right? Forget, because it's being repeated in tons of your stuff here, right? Right. So if you can generate that piece of code, that would be very useful. And of course. What, 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 what are we going to call this? Are we going to have it have its own separate function repository entry or what? That's your call. Max, what do you think? Well, let's see. I mean, I guess we could. It has so many functions already. It doesn't hurt to have this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. The question is, does it fit in the standard Wolfram model function? I don't think that it does. So eventually, we, we should have local multi-way systems in the Wolfram model. In this case, we could put them into the evolution object. I see. But that's a big refactoring, so it's not going to happen anytime soon. Right. Okay. Well, fine. All right. Let's call it Wolfram Model Multi Way Step. Okay. Okay. Should I, should I add that the function repository like Please. now? Okay. Yes. And that needs a rule. And I mean, it can have an operator form, but it needs a rule and a state. Right. But it shouldn't do equivalence checking. That should be the state union function. Or should it do? Yes. I, I, well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I mean, yeah, the thing is with, with string replaced list, it's like, it doesn't make any difference. But this no, is, yes, it does. Sure yes, it does make there. difference. It does make a difference. String That's why you have to do a union afterwards. Oh, okay. Well, fine. Then, then of course, okay. then it definitely shouldn't do the isomorphism checking. For strings, it will be its union that does that. For, for hypergraphs, it should be hypergraph union. Oh, God, that means the wrong thing, doesn't it? Hypergraph union would mean a union of hypergraphs. Yes. Or a yes, union it should be union hypergraph. with a different same function. Or whatever. Same test. Works. Yeah. Okay. So same test arrow 
hypergraph isomorphic Q, isomorphic hypergraph Q. So that, that should just work out of the box, right? I think so. Maybe too cool. slow though. Okay, so these are, okay, so this is basic evolution API. Okay, the next one is the causal API. Well, events API. Okay, what is the events API? What does that look like? That has to associate, that, that's the thing with the traced evolution thing that we had down in the multi-way system, right? Remember that? Where we have, remember this? That's this thing here, I believe. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We were going to change, Max. What did we do? We were going to change the structure of this list, right? Yes, I think so. And what were you we changing it to? We were changing it to. So it's prefix, then the rule, and then the suffix. Okay, so this is basically. Trace states list. So this is, so the next thing we want is event evolution function, which is analogous to trace states list. But what we want here is say it again. I'm sorry. Say, say again what we want. Well, for strings, it's prefix, rule, suffix. Okay. String prefix, rule, string suffix. Okay. And then what does that go to? That's just that each one of those is an event, right? An event... Okay. Is well, yes, as yeah. this, right? String prefix, rule, string suffix, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, how do we use those events? Right. What is this graph? Element-wise evolution causal graph. We we need to have something which is. So. For strings, okay, what is the analog of that for a hypergraph? So event specification just has empty suffix. What? Event specification will just have empty suffix and is otherwise the same. What are you talking about? I don't understand. This is a string prefix, string suffix that's saying where in the string the rule was applied. Right, so for a hypergraph, yes. what we need to give is... Well, rest. I, I, yeah, the... I think we need to give the rest of the hypergraph. Yeah, right, we need to give the... Um, um, uh, the rule and the rest of the hypergraph. Correct. And I don't know whether that, maybe there's a better analog here. See what I'm saying? Well, the maybe analog is really... hypergraph, there's no suffix. No, I, I know that, or no prefix, or whatever you call it. But maybe a better way to do this so that it's more analogous is to specify it as rule and then the list prefix suffix. See what I'm saying? 
because that's more analogous to this case for the hypergraph. Yeah, I think so. So maybe that's what we should do, which is incredibly close to what we had here. Well, those are indices. Those are indices there, though, which is wrong. Okay, so that's how we specify an event, the rule and the rest of the hypergraph. Do you agree with that? I mean, yes. Although, to be fair, in a hypergraph, we only need to give the rule because if the rule is instantiated, do you get what I'm saying? If it's instantiated on the hypergraph, then the labels for the instantiation define where it is. I don't think so, because these events are specific events. They have specific input. I understand that, but if you instantiate the event on the hypergraph, every node of the hypergraph has a label. So as soon as you instantiate the yes, rule... Yes, but the other label. nodes can be changed as well. What? The as the nodes can change as well. In other words, if, if these events are such that if something else changes in the hypergraph, it should become a different event. But an event is a single rule application. Well, these are global events, not local events. What do you mean? Well, I mean they specify the change between entire hypergraphs. I understand that, but uh, the point I'm making is each event instantiated on the hypergraph already labels what part of the hypergraph it affects. See what I'm saying? Not really. Okay, suppose you have a rule that says, you know, one goes to A. And then you have hypergraph one, two at some step, and you also have hypergraph one, two, three at some step. So how are you going to distinguish between one, two goes to two A and one, two, three goes to two, three A? By what you just said, because the, the rule is instantiated on the labels of that hypergraph. Yes, but the event should include the hypergraph. Well, why? I mean, it's because probably it's a global convenient. event. Yeah, it's convenient to include it. Okay. No, it's not just convenient, it's necessary because otherwise you have duplicate events which are not the same. You know, you have event one goes to A and you have many of those events for different hypergraphs. Okay, but do you agree that the instantiated rule and the rest of the hypergraph is what we would give for the event. Yes. Okay. All right, fine. Okay. So now for this API, so we have, what do we have? For a given state, find the events. Is that right? Is that, is that another API element? Looks like it. For a given state, find all events from that state. Is that right? Yeah. Which is generalization of uh, one we had before. From a given state, which is from a given state, find all states from that state. Yeah. It's right. a generation so, of string replace list and so on. Yes. Yes. Which is our traced states list. So this is the one that we then have to... Now, Jonathan, you do you have a version of this? Who has a version of this? 
And by the way, given this, is that sufficient to reconstruct the causal network? Not unless you know something about the underlying system. No, I, I realize that. You have to have something which is a combiner function. I think we're going to need one other function here that deals with these things, right? Um, okay. 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 How are we going to work on this multi-way thing? Am I going to do it? Is somebody else going to do it? What's going to happen here? Silence means I'm doing it, I suppose. Well, is it the next priority after hypergraph flood? I think so, because I think we're going to need this. Okay, listen, in my attempt to explain what's going on, I am going to need a version of this picture. Okay? Without question. We're going to need to explain how multi-way systems work. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Therefore, we definitively need this. And we're going to need it, you know, both, both the strings case and the Wolfram model case. I, by the way, I just emailed a prototype, like a prototype of the Wolfram model multi-way step to everyone, which seems to work with the union. What union? With the union with where same test is isomorphic order or to the hypergraph Q. Okay. Well, that's cool. So that means that we should be able to draw a, for some simple Wolf model case, we should, which you like the one you have here, we should be able to draw the multi-way system. I agree. What are we going to put in the nodes of the multi-way system in our illustration? I guess we can have miniature we have many versions of, of um, Maxime's hypergraph plot. I would Why think. not have them as like tooltips? Just have normal nodes. Well, if we're going to present them in some way where people can read it, we're going to have to have them. I, I think, I don't see why we shouldn't have, I mean, these are not going to be big because by the time the thing is big, we're not going to be able to draw its multi-way system. Either way, we can either tooltip it or put it in there. And I mean, that's a thing that is an option, I think, also in the multi-way system code in general. All right, I think I need to disappear here. Um, okay, what, what should I prioritize for the moment? I, I well, was prioritizing I mean, tests for, or filters for universes, but. Okay, look, here's what I want to do. I want to start doing this enumeration. So I would like to know whether Ed's code is just completely nonsensey. I would also like to know if you think you've generated Wolfram models that are causally invariant, that would be interesting. Uh, I'd like to get an yeah. inventory. Well, actually, there are a couple that you sent me that I, I, I can prove are causally invariant. Okay, well, let's start getting, I mean, those should be ultimately going into the a repository of notable universes with a tag that says they're causally invariant. Gotcha. But I mean, you could just start making a file of known causally invariant ones. Sure. Okay. So what, what, I, what I was planning to prioritize was to produce a kind of production ready theorem prover for causal invariants and causal in invariant, not invariants, but. I think that sounds good to me. That sounds okay. useful. Sounds sure. highly useful. I mean, I think that, um, but I think it would also be nice as a side effect to start enumerating ones that you know are causal invariant. Sure. But both for strings and for multi-way systems. I mean, for, and for Wolfram model systems. Okay. 
Uh, okay, and then so okay, so then Max is working on hypergraph plot, and then the next step, and I might work on this if I if I, um, is the refactoring of multiway system. I mean. I, I would offer to help, but I just I wasn't there when any of it was designed or any of the decisions were made. So, I, yeah, sure I, know, I know, I understand, I understand. Well, I'm going to be available later today, and I will be probably I'll 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 ping you guys. But I think Max should be left to work on hypergraph plot because that's the next thing we know. Yes. We yeah. Um. If you're around later, Jonathan, um, then maybe we could pair code multiway system. Okay. Um, I can do that. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll ping you a bit later. Um, and um, right, fine. And I think we're. Yeah. I just want to. I really want to start doing the search because I want to find out. And so having some sample cause and variant things will be very useful in that search. Because we want to look at ones which are both are causal invariant and aren't causal. I mean, a very cool thing to be able to do would be to able to be enumerate able to enumerate causally invariant all from model systems. Anyway, okay, all right, let's wrap it up. Okay, cool. thank you, everyone, and um, uh, yeah, good. Okay, and again. This is, I mean, this is one of the things we're aiming for, is to get a good version of this picture. Which I agree, in that picture, we have reduced, I mean, in that picture, unfortunately, we don't have the event nodes showing up as different from the um, state nodes. See what I'm saying? This picture is a mess. You, Jonathan, you understand what this picture is, right? Yeah, yeah right. I, I think I think we came up with it. It's just I wasn't there for its implementation. Right. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. Talk to you all soon. Okay. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Bye.